Hi, I'm Robin Forster with Feel So Alive, and thank you for your patience as we get started today. And as you can see up on the screen, my name and my website, and also I'm in booth 34, which is just right outside the door. It's conveniently located. Okay, and what we're talking about today is um, 10 tips to a greener home that you can implement now. But first, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for coming to this presentation on 10 tips. And I know that we're all in different places when it comes to our, our journey on being green and living a more sustainable lifestyle. So I have two quick questions for you all. One is, how many people here are currently living in a tiny house? Okay, kind of. <laughs> okay, so kind of, I have to ask what that means. I know, and you both have your mouth full. I'm so good at asking questions like that. <laughs> so it's a small house. It's a small house. Okay. okay. But you're heading towards a tiny house, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, and how many people here are thinking about being in a tiny house within the next five years or so? Okay, excellent. Okay, so it sounds like we are all on the same page here. So part of what was important to me was to make sure that I gave you all a lot of value in this presentation, because it is Saturday, and we are hanging out here on a Saturday. Um, when I started preparing this, one of the things I wanted to make sure was that my research was current on green practices, zero waste, and sustainability. And I am a master recycler from Lane County, so I had to... <laughs> all right, okay, so who all here is from Lane County? Great. Yeah, we've been asking people outside with our booths where people are from, and there's a lot of people from Eugene here, which is awesome. I really appreciate that. Okay, so for me, being a bit of a geek when it comes to drilling down on the why of things, um, and I think that you all are going to want to thank my business coach for this because I wanted to start out with statistics and science and all of that, and five minutes into showing her my draft, her eyes were rolling. And she said, no, 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 you can't do that. And I said, but that's the really good stuff. And so our compromise was to tell you all what I learned in a way that you can actually use it. So that's my goal today. And does that sound good? Okay, awesome. Okay, so what we're looking at is a quick review of a greener lifestyle basics. And I'm sure that most of you are doing a lot of these things. And so that's why I call it a review. And part of what I found in my life, and I'm hoping this is true for y'all too, is that sometimes we forget. You know, we come up with a really good thing that we like that's helping us to be greener, and then it just somehow gets lost. So I thought it would be helpful to go ahead and review these things. So, um, one, oh, and I wanted to tell you too is that I have all of this on a PDF, and it's in a Google Doc, so whoever wants it, totally forgot to bring the piece of paper in here. Stop by my booth, give me your email address, and I will email you the PDF on this so you don't have to worry about taking notes. Ah, okay, well it's up to, it's up to you all. I think that since it's a small group, we can just, yeah, stop by the booth. Um, okay, so doing the research to update myself, it was really fun. There's like three R's or there's four R's, depending on how you look at it. And what we're looking at is the, um, the three R's, as you all know, is recycling, reuse, and reduce. And that's kind of our mantra. And then the four R's are about living lighter on the planet. And let's see. Oh, and so I do have a lot of resources, and that's part of why I think you're going to want the PDF, because I have a whole ton of links in here, because I was doing a lot of research. Okay, so when we break it down, if we look at refusing, that's really the first concept, is don't bring it into your house in the first place. Sometimes we can't do that, but that's the goal, is to not bring it in at all. And the practical side of that is, where are you gonna put it? I mean, really, space is an issue. Okay, and the emotional side is, why did you buy that? Did you really need that? And then looking at the financial side, is, is that really a good place to put your money or was there another choice? So looking at reducing, we're talking about less consumption. And um, 
this is a list of, I, I said it was going to be 10, it's really 17 different things that you could do. And just going through this really quick, you know, transportation, look at doing it a different way. Can you carpool? Can you ride your bike? Um, buy local, buy seasonal, turn off your lights, unplug your electronics. Uh, home insulation, you want to have it really efficient and insulated well with efficient heating and cooling systems. And I'll talk about how that affects a tiny home later on when we get into tiny home top tens. Take shorter towers, showers and brush your teeth with the water off. Usually little kids are really good about wanting to leave the water on when they brush their teeth and that's really not a sustainable action, so please don't do that. Um, don't use your dryer if you can avoid it. Purchase concentrated multi-purpose cleaners. Do you really want 50,000 cleaners underneath your sink? Um, also, reduce your use of packaged foods. Plant a garden. Pay your bills online. Wash your clothes in cold water. Group your Amazon orders if you're still doing that. And eating beef. Eating beef is really not a sustainable practice and it doesn't really work out well. And part of the problem with that, it's interesting, my notes page cuts off right at the good stuff. So it's kind of like that's interesting. Part of the problem with beef, and I'm not advocating going vegan or vegetarian or any of those things, I'm just saying let's be aware of what's happening with beef. And if you look at, for example, the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest, that's all about hamburgers. So is that really how we want to take care of our planet? So I just want you all to think about that. Okay, and I know a lot of this is review, so that's why I'm trying to go through it pretty quickly. I mean, how many people are doing most of these things already? Yeah, exactly. That's kind of what I figured. Okay, you all know to use a water bottle, use your own coffee cup, bring your grocery bags and your veggie bags, um, your straws. My daughter is a big straw fan. She loves them. I don't. So she has metal straws, she has bamboo straws, she has glass straws, and she has holders to carry them in her purse. If that's what works for you, awesome, go ahead and do that. Just don't do plastic straws. Um, take out containers, take it with you so that you can take your food home, rechargeable batteries, uh, make up rounds. This is something, and so for those of you who don't do this, you don't have to listen, but for those of us who do do a skincare routine, for years I have been buying organic cotton rounds and cotton balls in plastic bags. And I was looking at, because you know, I'm thinking about I want less plastic in my life, less plastic in the waterways. And I was looking at this sitting on my, um, my counter in the bathroom and I thought, why am I buying this in plastic? I'm throwing this away. I'm using this one time. That's not sustainable. And so then I start researching, and right now I'm looking at three different brands that I'm using that are made out of cloth that I rewash. So that blog post will be out in probably about two weeks. So something to think about, what is it that we're doing in our lives that we don't think about that we can kind of like peel the onion back on another layer of going green and work through the sustainability. Uh, Secondhand clothes for shopping and use the tool exchange instead of buying a tool. Okay, and recycling, recycling is a whole different ball game. It's not, most of us like to put it in the bin. How many people here have trash pickup and so you have a bin that you put your recycling in? Okay, and how many times have we put things in there that we thought we could recycle, but weren't really recyclable? It's easy to do, it's called wishful recycling. And, and I know a friend of mine one time, I did a post on Facebook and we were talking about it, she said, oh yeah, I throw my dryer sheets in there. Well, that's awesome if the people who do your waste can recycle that. But if they can't, then it doesn't work. And so what we're talking about is the MRFs. And the MRFs are the material recovery facilities. And the bottom line on recycling is if somebody else can't take that and use it and make it into something they can sell, we can't recycle it. You know, and I know that there's a lot of issues around plastic and, you know, China and that whole thing, but my point of view on that is if we had been giving them pure products that was just the plastic that they wanted to recycle, we could probably still be doing that. But have you all seen the pictures of the bins of all the stuff that we had in there? I mean, there was cardboard, there was shoes. I mean, it was so contaminated that of course they couldn't use it. 
So we need to look at what we're doing and how we can do a better job with that. And I'm not sure around this area if you're doing a recycling roundup. I know Lane County is doing that so that we can recycle the tubs, um, the bigger containers. So you need to ask in your area how to recycle some of the plastics that we used to be able to do. Like Nancy's yogurt, for example, in Eugene. They have a recycling day every so often where you can bring all your containers and they'll take them back. But so that's kind of the 411 on, oh, and pizza boxes. I've had more discussions with people. It's cardboard, of course I can recycle it. No, you can't. You contaminated it with a pizza. Sorry, don't care what you think, it's contaminated now. You cannot recycle it. So next time you have a discussion with somebody, remember that. Okay, and now getting into tiny house specific. Um, and looking at what it was that I found that was so scary is that tiny houses are a tiny air pocket. And I actually did quite a bit of math on this. And I'm not a math geek, so if anybody sees any errors, please let me know. But what we're looking at, the short version, is there's approximately 120 square feet of living space in a tiny home. That means there's approximately 1,600 cubic feet of air. A 1,700 square foot traditional home has about 136,000 cubic feet of air. So think of, just for a visual, think of the tiny home being, uh, for example, fitting into the kitchen of most traditional houses. So think about that kind of space and the amount of air that you have in that space, which is not a whole lot. So what scared me was the indoor air pollution. Um, and I wanted to talk about that for a minute, but because I can't get my notes to do that, I'm gonna flip the page. So if y'all can just hang on a second. probably have some examples before we get into tiny house specific that you're doing in terms of reusing not bringing things into your home do you really want to share something that was kind of obvious that I missed on the list okay so it sounds like I covered the, the top ones okay good okay so when we're looking at indoor air pollution think about how energy efficient we want our dwellings right I mean, they're just about airtight-ish, as much as we can make them, and we're doing that for efficiency. But what happens is the air exchange inside is marginal, if any, and that doesn't work out at all well. Considering, think about your lifestyle now, most of us are spending about 90% of the time indoors. So we're rebreathing that air, and part of what happens is that air starts to get stale and one of the numbers that I saw was that with the air, we're looking at the inside being three to five times more polluted than the outside air. And that's even looking at industrial cities. So think about being in a tiny house with not a whole lot of air to start with, and you very quickly are breathing stale air, which is not a good thing. So let's look and talk about some of the potential problems for example, if you use propane to cook with, you need to make sure that it's vented correctly because that is heavy. You guys use propane? Is that, I just saw the smile on your face. <laughs> Was there something you wanted to add? Are you sure? Okay. okay. Um, if you're using propane, it's heavy and it can displace the air. So if you don't have a whole lot of air to start with and you have propane that's really heavy, you're gonna have even less air, which is not gonna work out well. Um, and if you have a shower or a sink, you're going to have moisture, which means you're going to have mold, because again, you're in a little tiny pocket. And what is your heat source? Is it vented? And how is it vented? And then, was your home built with particle board? Because that's off-gassing, it's got glue in it. So you need to think about the construction also of what's going into your home. And do you burn scented candles or do you use oils? because that's gonna fill up your air also. So think about what it is that you wanna be breathing. And when we look at a traditional home with a forced air furnace, 
they're replacing the air in the room every hour. So how often are you replacing it in your home? And one of the recommendations I've seen is to every day open up your house for five minutes so you can get some airflow going through. But how many of us really do that? Something that we need to think, you guys do that? Did I see a hand? Okay, good. <laughs> Okay, and something else I wanted to show you, which you probably can't see very well. This is from Dr. Doris Rapp, and what she has done is, um, this is a writing sample, and she's a, a doctor, and this is a child's writing homework, and the child was upstairs, and, oh, excuse me, Lisa's about 12, I think, in, in this article, and her mom was downstairs doing laundry, so the fumes were coming up, and that was all. She wasn't like in the same room. This is the fumes of the chlorine bleach, sorry, I didn't say that, that was coming up and wafting into her um, area where she was writing and trying to do her homework. And this is a story of the life of a boot. And it changes, and you can see, I think, how her handwriting changes according to the fumes. And then the story also changes, and she starts talking about how much she hates herself and her boots. It's like, ah, and that's just from breathing the fumes of chlorine. So another reason why it's so important for us to take care of um, the cleaning products that we have in our home. And just imagine if that was in a tiny house. Okay, so looking at toxins, I was trying to figure out an easy way to break this down because there's over 100,000 chemicals that we're breathing and exposed to, and the FDA has approved very few of them. So one of the things, I liked how Sloan Barnett in her book broke it down into four categories. So we're looking at carcinogens, and we know that those are chemicals that cause cancer. We're looking at pterogens, which are chemicals that cause birth defects, and then developmental reproductive toxins are chemicals that damage the normal development of the fetus, and endocrine disruptors are chemicals that interfere with normal hormone and functioning. And they're found in detergents, flame retardants, food, cosmetics, pesticides. Um, and when you buy a new shower curtain, for example, does anybody notice the smell when you take it out of the container? So not okay for us to breathe. There's so many different chemicals going on with that. You've got the thiolates that are carrying the scent. You've also got all of these chemicals that we're talking about and it's clearly a carcinogen, so we don't really want to be doing that. But it's something to know about. The reason I've got this up is I liked how this group, this is from the food.fm TV, I liked how they broke this down. And again, I know it's hard for you to see on the PowerPoint. And you know, I'm happy to send you the PDF of this whole presentation, so just stop by my booth, which is right outside there, and I'll get your email address. But what I liked about how they were breaking this down and laying it out is that, um, let's see, on, on one hand, um, we could appreciate how they laid this out. On the other hand, how often that we, awful that we have this many chemicals that we have to figure out and to live with. So they've broken this down for those who can't see it into environmental toxins, household chemicals, beauty and personal hygiene, toxic packaging, food additives, and common allergies. <coughs> Excuse me, so I thought it would be kind of fun to do some examples. And so the first one I wanted to look at is Windex, because I think, don't we all know Windex? Familiar with it? Yeah, it's been around a long time. Okay, some of the ingredients, and I'm probably gonna mispronounce these, uh, water we know, two hydroxyl, Essel, whatever, ammonia, ammonia, chlorhydrate, laurel. Anyway, y'all can see what these are, and they're not things that we want to do. Um, part of what happens if someone drinks the ammonia hydroxide, which is in this, which according to MedlinePlus.gov is poisonous, it's found in many industrial products and cleaners. So if somebody drinks it, what should you do? Do not make the person throw up. If aluminum hydroxide is on the skin or in the eyes, flush with lots of water. So that's a little scary. Okay, looking at another example, which is pretty common, which is 409. 
And you can see, I think, the active ingredients. Can you all read those? Okay, okay. Um, what we're looking at here, it's used in scrubbing bubbles, Clorox disinfectant wipes, Tylex, bathroom cleaners, um, and it's incredibly toxic and cancer causing. So if y'all are doing this, come see me. I have some suggestions on something else. And then I was thinking about hand sanitizers because we all use them and we've all heard a lot about the trichal sands and how awful they are. So what is the story with that? And this from my research is you want the alcohol based one. You don't want the one with the trichal sands in it because there's a lot of issues around the bacteria learning to adapt to it, which is not what we want. So this is one of the suggestions. Um, the trichal sands have been found in water sediments and in soil in many parts of the world. Which, um, does that scare anybody else that we've got all these chemicals floating around all over the place? Yeah, we're not exactly being good stewards. So back to some of the scary stuff um, and the health effects in a small, tiny house, for example, is carbon monoxide is really a big deal and it's something I think we don't really think about, but if you have an unvented kerosene or gas space here, a leaking chimney or furnace or a gas stove, you could be feeling fatigue, chest pains, headaches, dizziness, and you don't really know what it's coming from, and that's what it's coming from. Formaldehyde, do you all remember this story? I think it was Johnson & Johnson turned out their baby shampoo. Actually, the chemicals reacted with each other and cremated formaldehyde. So a lot of moms are washing their kids' hair in formaldehyde. So we, as consumers, have to be really diligent to look and see what's going on with the products that we're using. And how many people here have watched the story of stuff? You're familiar with it? Okay, good, okay. My favorite is the one on cosmetics because it talks about chemicals and it talks about how we got started with them and where we're at with them now. So if you haven't seen this, there's an eight minute version. You can go and watch it. And again, if you want the PDF that has the link, let me know and I'm happy to send it to you. Okay, so looking at tiny house and tiny air pocket, we're looking at indoor air pollution, venting, building and domestic use. And I thought it would be kind of fun to do a tour and see if we can see what some of the problems are. So you're all ready to do a little tour? Okay. And I took these pictures off the internet. I have no idea about copyright. I just want to be real upfront about that. I was like, oh, that's a good one. I want to use that. So looking at this one, it's a nice rustic shower. It's a nice DIY. But can you see what some of the potential problems with this arrangement are? We can do hands, you guys. It's fine. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Go ahead and tell us one. It's like a wood wine barrel, and it's going to hold a lot of moisture. Yeah, perfect. For those who couldn't hear her, she was saying it looks like a wooden wine barrel, so it's going to cause problems with moisture. And I actually spotted five different things in here that were a concern for me. So, so far we found one. Can you all find any others? Again, think about small space. What's the floor? What's the floor in there? It looks like it's wood. Yeah. Yeah. So what I found was, first of all, I don't see a vent. And in a tiny house, you need to have venting. Okay, also the towels, the way that it's hung up that way, it's not opened up. The towel's not going to dry. So it's going to bring an incredible amount of bacteria. And it's going to smell, which is not going to be fun. Um, also, let's see, um, oh, and I got some of that information from Steve Bordstein. He's co-author of the Clothing Doctor's 99 Secrets of Clean and Clothing Care. And what he's recommending is, is that you only use one towel for three showers, and then you switch it, and that's because of the bacteria content. Uh, the wine barrel that we talked about, and the floor looks like it's wood, and in this picture, it looks like it's wet. And I don't know how many of you have had bathrooms where you've had dry rot because there was water in the floor and you didn't know that and it seeped down. Not a fun project and in a tiny home, you can just imagine all the bacteria and problems. Okay, so slide number two, the kitchen room tour. How many potential problems can you guys spot here? Do 
want some help? Okay. Uh, the first one I was looking at was I don't see a vent above the sink, which is going to be really important because, again, that's moisture. And thank you that you're in this little tiny plastic envelope. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, the plant can be a plus or a minus depending on the care. Is there fungus growing in the plant or is it being taken care of and so it's helping to disperse the air and, and to, to uh, clean up the air? And then the glass top stove, which you all probably can't see. It's right there. And it is hard to see. It took me a while to notice that. Uh, I'm not seeing any vent above it or any venting system at all. So there was three that I counted in there. And then the wood stove. What potential problems do you all see with a wood stove? question is, is it vented correctly? Because think what that's going to do in terms of sucking oxygen out of the air if it's not vented correctly. Are the owners maintaining the wood stove properly? How many people here have lived in a traditional house with a wood stove or a fireplace? Okay, you know you have to have someone come in and clean it, otherwise the creosote builds up and that does not work out well. I actually had a flu fire one time, very embarrassing. Um, so that's part of my question there. And from what I've been learning is it's not a good idea to store the wood inside the house because you're bringing in more bugs, you're bringing in more issues, and so they recommend not to do that. Okay, and so that is the end of this tour. And are you ready for the list of top 10 for the greener house so that you can implement now? Okay, so what we have is um, 10 tiny house tips that you can implement now. The first is cleaning products. Look for organic, multi-purpose, concentrated cleaners. To go ahead and do a venting audit, look at what you've got going on in your house so you have awareness around it. Does it need service or is it fine? You're not going to know until you look. And a dampness quest. Is there any? Where? What's going on? Where is it coming from? For example, in our house, I've been hearing, it's not a tiny home, it's a traditional house. I've been hearing the sound of water running, but not really strong or very loud. And I'm trying to pin down what is going on with that. And it turns out I took the tank top off of the toilet, which is different uh, in a tiny house, but I took it off and I realized I'm starting to get mold inside the tank. So problem needs to be addressed, but now I know that I have the problem. Okay, also allergy control. When you're looking at dusting, keeping the dust mites and cat fur under control. In a tiny house, remember you've got so little air that anything becomes a big issue. And you don't want to cause allergies and you don't want to have a lot of those sinus issues. And personal care products, are they safe? Are they non-aerosol? Are they non-toxic? Remember that your skin is the largest organ in your body. Whatever you put on your skin is going to go in your body. So look at the ingredients on what you're using and make sure that it's what you want to be using. Okay, also cloth. Look at non-toxic. We can now get organic cotton, which is awesome. And has anybody researched how cotton is grown these days? What's going on with it? Okay, it's really gross and will really gross you out. Not only is the seed, a lot of times GMO, not 100%, but a lot GMO, there's so many pesticides and insecticides used on cotton. And think about how we're sleeping in that and we're wearing that. So when you can, look at, at making a different decision. Um, paper products in the bathroom, non-toxic, no bleach. And I was reading this one, it was so funny. Has anybody read No Impact Man, the book, or seen the movie? He's so funny, he's living in New York City, and he's living in the city in an apartment, and he decides to go no impact. Now, he's got a wife and a kid, so you can imagine there's a little bit more trash going on in the household. And he talks about how using dried grasses and moss does not work as a toilet, sub as a toilet paper substitute. You just wanted to put that out there right away, that that's not what he had in mind. 
Um, also, looking at pots and pans in your storage containers, you want to make sure that you're not using anything that's Teflon or coated because, as we all know, that comes off and we're going to eat it and inhale it. And then we want to use glass containers. And there's a number of reasons for that, and one of them is really practical. When you look in your tiny refrigerator, you want to be able to see your foods and see them really quickly. And the other thing we've done in our household is we bought labels that are reusable, so we can label our foods, put a date on them and what it is, so it's easy to make sure that everything is fresh and kept up to date. And um, I was talking to uh, Kelly, who is the Master Recycler Director for Lane County, and I said, what are the things you want to make sure that I cover in here? What seems to be most important? And in Lane County, what she was saying is that 9% of what goes into the landfill is plastic. And about, sorry, I wanted to get this number right for y'all. Um, let's see, she said food waste and wasted foods are important topics. Food is the largest single category of waste in the Lane County landfill at 18%. It creates methane in the landfill. Plastic is only about 9%, even though it's there forever. So plastic is something that's a little challenge for us to do individually, but we can. There's things we can do we've talked about. But food waste, that's something we can all do something about as soon as we get home. Um, and then I wanted to tell you about my fish friendly car wash, just a quick shout out. One day I was walking up the street from my house and I saw this younger person, you know, college age. He was out there washing his gorgeous Mustang and looked like it was kind of new. And I was looking at the suds and all the suds were, were running down and running into the storm drain. And I thought, huh, I wonder what's up with that. So I called and found out that in Lane County, or at least in Eugene Springfield area, the storm drain does not get treated. It goes all into Fern Ridge Reservoir, or sometimes in the Willamette, depending on what part of town you're in. So think about what you're swimming in and what you're fishing from. So is that really the kind of community we want to be in? Let's tell people to use non-toxic cleaners when they're going to do that. So I explained how to do a car wash as a fundraiser in the fishfriendlycarwash.com um, because everyone's always doing fundraisers and they're doing car washes. Okay, and just to bring you up to date in terms of what's happening in Oregon, um, the governor has recently signed a bill, which you all may know about, banning single-use checkout bags. That's effective in 2020. Does not include bags for produce, meat, fish, or dry cleaning. Oh, and the dry cleaning chemicals? I'm sorry, I totally forgot. Those you do not want in a tiny house. They are so, um, I don't know what the word is, but you're going to breathe them. They're just they're such an incredible VOC. You don't want anything dry cleaned in a tiny home. Um, getting back to the PowerPoint, in Oregon, retail establishments will be required to charge at least five cents for, for paper bags with 40% post-consumer recycled content or more. Reusable plastic bags um, and then fabric bags. And then she also signed a bill banning distribution of single-use plastic straws except upon request. So. For those of us who are in um, restaurants and see the straws come as not even being asked, it just comes as part of getting water, it's like this will change that. Um, and then this is pretty much the end of the presentation. This is how to get in touch with me. I am on Instagram and Facebook, and I also have resources. I'll show you real quick. I have some, these are some of the resources that are throughout, and again, it's in the PDF. Um, are there any questions? Yes. We love that, man. It smells. Okay.